attention to our coming attractions over on the side. And also, we are having a drawing after the show, and uh, we'll be drawing for a couple of copies of Mr. Haltner's book, The Town That Went to War. If you'd like to put your name down on a slip for that drawing, please, please do. Um, and it's my honor to introduce Ms. Teresa Irish. First-hand history in the letters of her father, Mr. Errol Bud Irish, A Thousand Letters Home. A Thousand Letters Home is named Reviewer's Choice by Midwest Book Review and Small Press Book Watch. In addition to selecting A Thousand Letters Home for the Winter 2013 Recommended Reading List, Military Writers Society of America called it a fascinating book, a treasure trove, and concluded highly recommended, which I can personally attest to. enjoyed it enormously. A Thousand Letters Home has also received an, an honorable mention in the 20th Annual Writer's, Self, Writer's Digest Self-Published Book Awards, which included three, more than 3,000 submissions. Ms. Irish was a featured speaker, author at over 60 events in five states in 2012, and appeared on ABC News, NPR, National Defense, Veterans Radio, Military Author Radio, the story of the journey of the letters has been reported in newspapers throughout the country. The book's introduction, and, as well as letters, an excerpt and vocabulary you should have in your hands. And it's also on um, www.1000lettershome.com. And currently showing in um, special collections, Alpina Room is a slideshow of featuring images from the um, World War II collection, Elton Heron's Letters, donated by a local family. Our library. Ms. Irish, Ms. Teresa Irish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on this cold, wet night. I said if this was last night, we may not have had many people here with Michigan playing. And uh, if you would have been here, I graduated from Michigan State, so I'm glad I can say that this week to someone. Okay, very good. And uh, thank you for your patience. I drove up, I live in the Detroit area, and it was just torrential rains on the drive today. So it's kind of a cozy night to be in together. And it's nice to see so many of you here, so thank you. Matter of fact, my long lost friends are sitting in the third row over here. I was down in Venice, Florida on vacation recently. My mother has not been very well. And you'll learn about tonight as Elaine. And so I went down, down, down to uh, Florida for a week with my husband, and we went down and did some things and checked around our home and all, and we were walking on these jetties out into the water, and someone had a sweatshirt tie that had Mackinac, I think Mackinac Island on the back of it, and my husband said, oh, Michigan, and they said, Alpina, and I said, Alpina, and my husband said, she's going to be there in two weeks, so I'm really happy to see them here today, thank you. I promised Meg I would help with recruiting, because I want you to know down in Venice, Florida, I was busy doing just that, so. Is my sound okay with everybody? Very good. Well, first off, I'd like to start by acknowledging the veterans that we have in the group. So if you're a veteran of any war, can we ask you just to raise your hand? I know you're modest folks and don't. Very good. I'd like to say thank you to our veterans. <laughs> Especially some veterans to whom this is going to hit pretty close because we have some World War II veterans here with us today as well. And I usually start the presentations by stating that tears are a sign we love because generally throughout the course of the evening, myself included, it gets a little bit emotional. And I have to start with a disclaimer. I'm not an author by trade. Uh, until recently, I was vice president for a national home health care and hospice company. And for the last 17 years, I've traveled 35 to 45 weeks a year, literally going to the Detroit airport and flying out. So this isn't what I do for a living. But an amazing thing happened to change my entire life. And that starts the story of the journey of the letters that I'd like to share with you tonight. But before I go into the letters, I have to tell you a little bit about my family and a little bit about my upbringing. My dad would write in one of his early letters that he was at a dance hall in Hemlock, Michigan. Anybody know Hemlock? Oh, a lot of people. Very good. My dad was from a dairy farm in Hemlock, and my mother was from a uh, soybean farm in Merrill just a little bit further west of Merrill, actually in what was called the Little Town of Ryan. It has a quaint little stone church that probably seats about 25 people. Beautiful little farming community. 
Well, my dad went to a dance at the dance hall back then. Anybody remember box socials? And you'd bid on the girls' old so the girls would bring in their social boxes, and the guys would bid on them. Well, my dad writes in one of his letters that he remembers looking across the room, across the dance floor, and that it was love at first sight. My mother writes in one of her letters that my dad had to grow on her for a little while. <laughs> However, she commented in his letter that she remembered the night that they had their first date, what wonderful manners he had, and his character, and his faith in God, and his integrity, and she just thought he was, he was probably a pretty good fellow. He was probably a swell fellow, which is nomenclature I've adopted in my life because my dad uses that all the way through, swell and fellows kicking, we're not kicking any, which was complaining. So my dad met my mom. They dated for two years before he went into the war. And he writes in his letters that he hoped that when he came back and married her, they would have two, maybe three kids. And he'd like the first one to be a boy. Well, they got married 20 days after he came home. And the first one was a girl. And the second one was a girl. And the third one was a boy, although it was a, he was born on my dad's birthday, January. The fourth one was a boy, the fifth one was a boy, the sixth one was a girl, the seventh the boy, the eighth the girl, the ninth the boy, and the tenth a daughter, rounding us out to five and five. And this is a picture of us, it's the last picture that we had before my dad passed away of their five boys and their five girls. So my dad complains in his later letters, he's over there in an army of occupation and all those married soldiers with kids back home have more points and get to come home and they're all way behind on having kids. But I assure you, in the little towns of Hemlock and Merrill, my dad and my mom made up for it because they soon had more than most of them and certainly than anybody in our family. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about my childhood. I was incredibly blessed because I grew up in a family that knew the importance of values. My mom and dad didn't have much when they got started. My dad came back from the war. He was a good saver all throughout his letters. He talks about saving money to come home and be able to buy a house with my mom. But when we were kids, we had to kneel together every night in prayer before we went to bed. And you had to sit at the table as a family for dinner, no matter what was going on, which when you're 12 and 13 and 14 and later in your teen years, there's a lot going on that makes you want to skip dinner. But my dad, if you yelled out, no thanks, I'm not hungry, my dad would say, then come to the table and let us see your smiling face because we're going to have dinner as a family. And around our oblong table that we had to accommodate the 12 of us, we had this two-sided bench. So each of the kids, when it was dinner time, just slid in, one after the other, and all the way around the bench. And if you had friends over, you just slid a little further and put another one in because what's 14 if you're already cooking for 12? So my parents also had this empty lot, and they, my dad bought the empty lot, I'm sorry, bought the empty lot next door to the house we lived in and built a new house to accommodate us all. And my dad had this thing that he didn't know a stranger, and he loved to sing. He was singing publicly in Hemlock at the age of 11, playing his guitar and singing songs. I tell you, God gave him a separate compartment in his mind for lyrics. He knew every lyric of every song you could name. It was really quite something. And he was singing at a young age, and music was a really big part of our life. And music is a really big part of my dad's letters as well, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. But my dad also had this thing where he didn't know a stranger. He was outgoing. I don't know if any of you remember the name Earl Nightingale, motivator speaker years ago. My dad was friends with him, and he always had to, like, be positive. As a matter of fact, some cold winter mornings when we got up for school, and my dad would say, come on, kids, let's hear it. Boy, am I going to have a good day. Of course, as a kid, you'd say, boy, am I going to have a good day? Can I go now? And my dad would say, come on, you've got to make your day what it's going to be. You've got to dream big about it. Now, my mom is very quiet, very strong, very stoic, very introverted. So it was an interesting contrast between my mom and my dad. My dad didn't know a stranger. If you walked into a bank, if he knew your name, he already had his song ready that he was going to sing that had your name in it. If he didn't and he saw your name, he was going to start singing a song. And of course, as kids, we were just so embarrassed by that all the time. But that was my dad. And he didn't sing, he didn't talk to babies, he sang to babies. So we kind of grew up knowing that that's how my dad was. And as kids, you're pretty mortified. I knew if I had a slumber party the next morning as he flipped blueberry pancakes on the griddle, he was going to get 
give all my friends their words of wisdom and life and sing a song with each of their names in it, but that was just the price of having a slumber party. And I remember also going away to college, Michigan State. And I remember a freshman year, you're feeling kind of sad and homesick and oh, so put out because you have a roommate and you have to go to these really hard classes. And I might come home and my dad would answer and he'd say, come on, Trisil, you got to dream your work and work your dreams. What you think about is what you become. If you plant roses or plant thorns, whichever one you water is the one that you'll grow. Will grow. And of course, I'd want to go, is mom home? Because <laughs> we all knew a mom would empathize and understand with the hardship in our lives. Well, it was soon after I graduated from Michigan State that I had my first experience of recognizing that my dad hadn't just been a dad in his life. My dad had been a young man with a different story that I didn't really know. And that happened when I packed up my little blue Chevette in the driveway of our home in Saginaw, Michigan, and I was moving to Pocatello, Idaho, sight unseen, for a job as the director of housing out there. Now, I did say Pocatello, Idaho. Anybody ever been to Idaho? Oh my goodness, zero. Okay. Well, I'm, one person said Idaho? We're in Idaho. In Idaho. Well, I'm quite sure the six years I lived in Idaho, everybody that I knew thought I lived in Iowa because nobody ever thought about Idaho from Michigan. And to this day, people will say, didn't you live out in Iowa for a while? But I have to tell you, I used to come home from Idaho. And before I even left, as I said, I was packing up my Chevette and my dad says, you know, sweet, I was one year younger than you when my mom and dad took me to the train station to leave for World War II. And I'm so proud and so pleased that at 21 years old, you can go anywhere in this world that you choose. And that price was worth everything to me, he said. And then when I used to come home from Idaho, my dad always wanted to go to the same place for dinner on the first night. Now, anybody remember Bill Knapps? Okay. What do we like for dessert at Bill Knapps? Chocolate cake. My dad had this philosophy that you should eat the best part of the meal when you're hungriest. <laughs> so while we ate our salads, my dad was eating his chocolate cake, scoop of vanilla ice cream, chocolate sauce, whipped cream, nuts, and cherry. And it never failed that when I came home from Idaho, even though my dad hardly needed to read the menu because we've been there for years, he would always pick up the menu and read it. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. Well, the waitress would come and my dad would say, ah, look, sweet, Idaho trout. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. And my dad would say to the waitress, my daughter runs the university out there. And I would turn to the waitress and say, I don't run the university out there. And my dad would say, oh, that place didn't know what it could be until she got out there to turn it around and build it up and make it what it is. And I would again turn to the waitress and say, I didn't really change the university in Idaho, and I don't run the university. But my dad had this thing that he always had to be saying that to people. Quite frankly, you think, every time we go somewhere, because if anybody asks how the family's doing, I hope they meant the question, because they were going to hear it. Well, quite a few years later was the second time that I had a real aha about becoming an adult in my relationship with my dad. And that was when my sister was the assistant to an executive at Ford Motor Company. She's been there for 40-some years, and a couple decades into it, they were doing a luncheon to honor her service with the company, and they're including Bill Ford and some of the other executive staff. And my sister called me, and she said, oh my gosh, what's the matter? She said, they just told me to invite mom and dad to the luncheon. <laughs> well, I knew what she was thinking. He was going to tell Bill Ford why their company was in good shape, and it had nothing to do with the Ford family. And my sister, unlike me, is more like my mother, where she's shy and she's quiet, so she does not like attention for the life of her. She wouldn't stand up here if you offered her a million dollars, it wasn't going to happen. So I understood what she was concerned about, but that was my aha moment. And I said to my sister, you know what? Some people would have to be worried that their dad drank too much and how he would behave. We just have to worry that our dads are too, our dad is too my sister said, wow, for the rest of my life, you've changed a perspective on me. And I said, we could have worse things than having a dad that loves to sing to everybody and is too proud of the things that we do. So that was an important time in my life in understanding.
understanding that my dad had this history of abuse and of the dream and of so many other things. So my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he went into the hospital the night before they were supposed to leave on a reunion to go back to the first company in France that had been freed by the American soldiers. And that little city was going to host them and do a thank you to them. And my dad went into the hospital, and he wasn't able to go on the trip, obviously, the next day, and shortly after was diagnosed with cancer. But I'm happy to tell you that my dad, again, said, you got to decide your own fate. And he studied everything, and he read everything, and he talked to different doctors. He didn't want surgery. He didn't want chemo. He didn't want radiation. He wanted to have a quality of life. And he became the first man to do intermittent hormone therapy ever. He's published in quite a few books about it. His research on it was all documented. He eventually spoke at the CDC in Atlanta to 600 doctors talking about options that are alternatives to radiation and surgery. And my dad believed you have to embrace your life and embrace your day and don't let people make decisions for you because what you have is such a gift. You need to go out and do the best thing that you can with it. Well, I'm happy to tell you that he had 17 wonderful more years. As a matter of fact, at the age of 82 in Venice, Florida, he won the Seniors Double Championship Tennis Tournament. He got a big trophy for it. And every year they went down to Venice, Florida. My parents bought a house there, or bought a condominium there at first when I was, I think, 13 or 14 years old. I'm 51 now. And we went down there every year. As the kids got older, we started going with in-laws and little kids, and we had a wonderful life down there. My parents loved their place in Venice, Florida. We knew about my dad's war experience. We knew about it because we knew he had the silver star and the purple heart and the bronze star. And we knew about it because on Christmas Eve, my dad, amidst all the Fisher Price toys and the energy and the celebration, at some point through the evening, he would all of a sudden get all choked up. And he would raise his hands and he would say, 42 years ago tonight, 51 years ago tonight, 57 years ago tonight, and just like Band of Brothers, some people here have seen Band of Brothers, and you see the interviews where they try to find their voices, it's exactly how my dad would be. And I remember each time he would say, oh, Dad, and I've spent a lot of time since we've lost my dad understanding what I meant when I would say, oh, Dad, it wasn't that I didn't want to hear his story, I think it's that I didn't want him to feel the pain. I didn't want him to be sad. And as you might imagine, on Christmas Eve, it was a little bit hard because you can't suddenly silence babies, you know, opening things and have the reverence you felt like you should have. But that happened, and so we knew that was an important night. And what had happened on Christmas Eve, my dad was part of the 102nd Infantry Cavalry Reconnaissance. And he and his buddy Verdell, who you meet early on in the book, Verdell is this big, booming Texas draw. And Verdell and he, we're in a four-story house on Christmas Eve in Germany when a mortar hit the house. And my dad was thrown four stories down, but he was okay. But Verdell, who early on in the book, you feel Verdell's dilemma because he's married, but he doesn't hear from his wife. She writes him, and then she doesn't write him. She's maybe going to come see him before he leaves, and she's not. And he's just heartbroken as he's faithfully following the path that they're taking him through Camp Maxie and Camp Swift and the Louisiana field maneuvers and on up to Fort Dix. Well, Verdell, that night, became a paraplegic as a result of the injuries that he sustained. And his marriage didn't last the war. But Verdell was sent back to an army hospital in Kentucky. And by golly, if he didn't meet a beautiful army nurse by the name of Betty. She was a lieutenant colonel army nurse. And Betty and Verdell got married, and they became friends the rest of our life. And I'll tell you this. When you met Verdell, you only saw his wheelchair one time. Because soon after that, you saw his beautiful blue eyes and his big booming drawl and his boisterous laugh. And talk about a man who inhaled life. I understand why he and my father became good friends. Well, Betty and Verdell became friends for our lives. And as I talked about the house my dad built next door to accommodate the 12 of us, if you drive past that house today, you'll still see on the front door and every single doorway in the whole house is built extra wide to accommodate Verdell's wheelchair. My dad and he stayed friends for life. And that was a great gift that we had in some of the memories and the acquaintances that my dad had with the war. So that was what happened on Christmas Eve that we always knew over the years. The other one was particularly emotional to me because it was on April 9th, today's date, 1945. My dad, in the last couple months of his life when he wasn't doing very well, 
Florida was his favorite place to go in Venice, Florida. We could see the Gulf of Mexico sunset right out our backyard. And my dad loved to go sit on his little bench in the backyard at sunset and play his guitar. And he'd just sing all those old songs. And he sang those old songs all throughout the book. As a matter of fact, in his early letters in the States, you'll see that at the end of his letters, he writes the top ten songs of Walt's time and Hit Parade as they're playing. And he loved to do that because that's the one time and place that he could picture exactly where my mom was doing the same thing. That little gal that he got engaged to and he put an engagement ring on her finger and his life savings, whatever that is for a 20-year-old farmer from Hemlock, Michigan, and the vault in Hemlock, Michigan, along with the other ring. And their courtship continued that way. And on April 9th of the year my dad passed away, a home health care nurse came in. And my dad, of course, what do you think he did as soon as she walked in the door? He sang a song with Candy's name in it. Candy took his vitals and she chatted. My dad was vibrant and I was sitting on the back porch with him that morning and that very day my mother had said to me, you know what, it'll be interesting to see if your dad remembers April 9th today because he'd been in and out of the hospital and some blood transfusions in the recent weeks and so we thought we'll just kind of see, but he was pretty preoccupied so we thought probably not. Well, Candy was finishing up her visit with my dad and all of a sudden my dad looks out at the Gulf and I remember thinking how beautiful his blue eyes looked in his white hair. And he started reminiscing. And he told Candy that 60 years ago that day, they were sent out on a mission, their five-man reconnaissance unit, when all of a sudden the Germans were hiding and completely surrounded them in open fire. The tankers tried to come in and help them, but they couldn't move either. And my dad talks about that he did exactly as they were trained. They had two, they had two jeeps, five men, one jump to the left, the right, and out the back, and tried to go for cover. But he writes in his letter of April 12th describing the events to my parents that when they ran for cover, Don Case laid so close to him that he could feel Don take the bullets next to him. And that day he lost Barney Stone and Don Case and Jack Davis, who my dad will tell you was the closest friend he'd ever had in his life to that point in his living. And he writes of the events and says that the Germans he felt like should hear his heart count. And my dad was hit over the head with the butt of a gun, as they did to all of them to make sure that they were dead. He played, he played dead for a few hours. And then he heard some Germans and people calling out for help, but he explains that you don't answer because many times the Germans would yell help in English, hoping that you would respond and then they would know where they were. So my dad eventually waited until the dark of cover, and he heard from a couple tanker guys who had been hurt. He promised that he was going to run and get help. And as he started to take off in the night cover of night, he came across one of the Jeep drivers, Cliff Gore, who was shot through the wrist and ran in the river. And Cliff wanted to go with my dad, and my dad assured him that he could move a lot faster without him, but he promised him he was going to get help. And my dad writes that he went back, and as he was coming out of the woods, one of the guys saw him, he was coming by in a Jeep, and he said, Irish, what are you doing up here? And I found this man after my dad died, and he said, your dad was disheveled, he had no hat, he had no gun, he had nothing on him. And he said, and I said, what are you doing out here? And he said, he told us the story of the ambush, and we took him over to the command center, and your dad kept saying, we have to go back and get those guys because I promised. And they said, we can't do that because we've lost so many medics. We can't send them into that area. And they agreed that they would go back, but my dad would, prompt, would agree that he was going to stand on the rider board of the, am of the ambulance waving a white flag, which my dad had no doubt that that was what he had to do. And that's what he did. And my dad finished telling Candy that story, and when we said goodbye to Candy and I walked her up to the car, Candy said to me, you know what? I think dementia has said it. And I said, it's not dementia. It's April 9th. So a couple days later, we decided it was time to bring my dad back to Michigan. And as I said, we were a musical family. My dad loved his music, and when we grew up, we were singing as a family. We sang Heart of Jesus was our travel song when we were in the car, we sang You'll never know, and tell me why, and Edelweiss, and how great thou art. And when we take, brought my dad home, they called ahead to some of my siblings, and my brothers were there to meet us at the Midland Bay City Saginaw Airport, and we flew on a medical charter. And lo and behold, if when they opened the door, who was at the top of the stairs, his hands raised, singing the green, green grass of home, but my dad. And my brothers all said, I thought you said he was like really close to dying. And I said, he was. We just got out of the hospital. Well, it was really something because we decided we should bring a hospice nurse in to talk to my dad because my dad had a great mind. My mom said my dad died at 84 with the mind of an 84-year-old man and the body or the, or the mind
mind of a 40-year-old and the body of his 84-year-old who had cancer. So the nurse came and my dad said, well, thank you very much for what you do, but I won't be needing your services. You see, there was one miracle one day in my life in April 9th, 1945, and I'm quite sure God isn't done with me yet. Because my dad believed that he had to embrace every day of his life. As a matter of fact, on a radio interview, I was asked one time, do you think your dad had survivor guilt? Because he lived when his three buddies did, and I almost recoiled at the question as a natural response. And I said, oh my gosh, just the opposite. My dad had survivor purpose. It's because he lived that he felt he had to give something back. As a matter of fact, he made a pact with those soldiers that if one of them lived, the one who survived would write to the families of the other ones. So I'll continue the part of the journey a little bit, a little bit later. So we flew home with my dad. He thanked the hospice nurse, but again told her God had one more miracle in store because he wasn't done on this earth. He had too many things to have to do. And I'll tell you, my dad didn't have idle days. You wouldn't find him sitting home watching TV on a Sunday afternoon, even at 30 or 81, 82, 83, he loved to take his guitar out to senior communities and just play songs in the, in the open community area and sing along with them. He was still climbing trees and cutting with his saw, and he bought some land out in Hemlock and went out there every day with his John Deere and loved to just be out in the country and work the land. But it was time. And we realized that, and on the next afternoon, we called our wonderful family priest, Father Heller, up in Saginaw, St. Stephen's. Father came in, my dad just beamed, and he said, you know, Father, I hope that God will be proud of how I chose to live my life, given that I was given the gift of life. And he also said to Father, I hope that God will forgive me for not having been a chaplain's assistant, something we really didn't understand at the time, but it wasn't appropriate to have a conversation about it with my dad at that moment. So my father had a beautiful last rites, and then on Tuesday, April 26th at 8.23 p.m., a beautiful sunny Tuesday night in the spring, it became clear that my dad's time was nearing. And we decided to give him back the music that he'd given us. So for the last hour of his life, seven of us sang to my dad, even though he hadn't been coherent for 24 hours. And the last song is my brother was pulling out his guitar to start singing the green, green grass at home. At 8.23 p.m., my dad opened his eyes and appeared to try to sing along, and he quietly and gently left us. And it was as beautiful of a moment as you can have when you have the gift of time. And I love that I had become insightful enough to understand in my youth the full circle that love and families and what the real riches of life are, which, by the way, have nothing to do with money, as I'm sure so many of you know. And it was a beautiful moment as my dad quietly left us. Well, as I told you, I had been traveling for 20, 45 weeks a year for 17 years. And I went back on the road soon after, and I tried to come up every weekend to be with my mom, who is my favorite human being on this earth, always will be no matter how long I live. She is just the sweetest little thing. She's all about 5'10", and it's been a little hard because she's became ill last December, and I've been staying home with her in Saginaw to be with her because I just promised when my dad left that she would never have to be afraid. As a matter of fact, soon after my dad passed away, my mom pronounced she was done cooking. Well, we happened to be out at Bain's Apple Farm. Anybody ever heard of that up in Saginaw? Okay. We happened to be in their little gift shop soon after my dad died. And in exactly my mother's decor was this little sign that says, Kitchen closed. This chick has had it. <laughs> so I bought her that sign, and it's still prominently displayed over her stove at home. Well, I'd been traveling, and my mom was going up to our cottage at Eight Point Lake, just outside of Clare. And I went back on the road, and I was down in Atlanta, and I called my mom, and I said, you know, Dad's been gone a month, and I just need to go somewhere and have a really good cry. Would you mind if on Memorial Day weekend, when you're up north with the other kids, that I just go be in your house? And she said, of course not. So I flew home from Atlanta on Friday night, and I got in my car in Northville, and I drove north to Saginaw. And it was 11.30 on Friday night of Memorial Day weekend in 2006, when I pulled my dad's army trunk in from our back porch. We always known about my dad's army truck. It was in our house our entire life. And on more than one occasion, one of us would say to my dad, hey, Dad, how about we come home and go through the army trunk with you? And my dad would say, maybe someday. He never invited. We never pushed. We never opened it together. And because my dad talked about the war, we didn't really think there would be a lot in there 
that would be unique or different or that would be a surprise to us because he didn't really have a reason to not share things because he talked so much about the war. But lo and behold, when I opened that army trunk, I saw this top tray that had the things many of our veterans had, his field shaving kit and his medals and a German Luger and a couple Sagers and some German coins and none of it was a big surprise. And then when I opened the top, took off the top tray, literally left to right, front to back, bundled in little frail ribbons, neatly stacked away and tucked in, were my dad's literally 1,000 handwritten letters of his 38 months in World War II. Every one of them was in the original envelope on that thin onion paper. Can you gentlemen remember that thin, thin paper? Two-sided and little tiny handwritten. Some with as many as 10 pages in one envelope. And this is a picture, of course, of one of the envelopes, and it's one of my favorites because it captures everything. It's November 19, 1944, so he was in Germany. And I love the stamp in the bottom left-hand corner that many of you may recognize from the censors which of course had to black things out. My dad always asked my mom and his parents whether or not his were censored because he was curious what they would take out. And I have to tell you, I didn't really understand my history very well. I didn't know the origin of the old saying, loose lips, sink ships, and why all that was so important, and why you couldn't tell about what was going on or where you were about a death of a buddy for 30 days. And I have to tell you, my life changed that night. And if you don't mind, I'd love to read one of the letters to you to sort of give you the feeling of what I experienced and where my journey started that evening, if that's okay with everybody. Okay? This particular letter is written on December 27, 1944, Wednesday evening in Germany. Dear Mom, Dad, and Family, I just finished a letter to Lane which is the first I've written in well over a week. We just haven't had the opportunity to write as we've been spending most of our time in foxholes. The weather here is getting colder now and the temperature drops to near zero at night. We don't kick about the, the cold whatsoever though as the ground is frozen solid now so our tanks can roll and our airplanes can take off. The days have been clear and sunny and at night the sky is filled with stars and a big moon lights up the earth. We didn't receive any mail Christmas Eve, and then I got four letters from Elaine. It sure made me happy to hear that you would all be together for Christmas dinner on, on Christmas Day. I suppose you're wondering how I spent Christmas. Well, folks, Christmas Eve and day were spent, as were several days before, in a foxhole on the banks of the Roar River. The moon came out bright at 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve, and it was throwing its beams on the river. The river itself is about 75 feet wide, but it has a mighty swift current. The ground was white with frost, and off in the distance, the Germans had a loudspeaker, and they were playing Christmas carols and putting out propaganda. At 12 o'clock, a church bell was ringing deeper into Germany, and our mortars were throwing a few shells across the river, and then another bell would ring. I said to Hayes that next day, it's really funny how people could be ringing church bells and maybe talking about the spirit of Christmas, when if they would only surrender or hadn't started this war, millions of people would be celebrating Christmas the right way tonight. Here we are, Germans and Americans, facing each other across a little river and thinking of peace on earth and just watching in tense silence for an enemy to move so that we can riddle each other with bullets. At 4.30 Christmas morn, Everything was so quiet with the exception of a few shells our artillery was sending over, and my thoughts turned to home where it would be 11.30. The choir would be just starting to sing Christmas with the carols before midnight mass, and you would be there or on your way. I thought back to Christmas of old when we used to be altar boys. I was wondering where Tom O'Brady, Bill Little, and Archie Chauvin and some of the other fellows were tonight, and if we might all be together next Christmas. I wish you'd say hello and Happy New Year to everyone for me. I'd write them, but there just isn't time. Christmas Day, we took turns scrambling out of our foxholes and up to an old building in the town behind us where we had Christmas dinner. It seems Uncle Sam can't pick the place we eat, but he always makes sure that we have a good holiday dinner. We're back a couple miles now. Last night, we had another mail calling. Did I ever get the packages? 
Elaine's package was a big tin of assorted nut cakes and was really swell. Aunt Ernie sent canned meat, crackers, peanuts, candy, and the writing paper that I'm using now. They sure are a treat, and this writing paper is about the best kind. If you want to send any, please send this as a folder can be used as a desk, and it just fits in the ditty bag. Your packages, especially the ones with the mitts, were the best of any, because I've been looking forward to them coming each day. I can't even explain how swell and warm they are. Last night I wore them for the first time, and my hands were warm all night. The Army gloves are good, but they can't compare to those mitts. I also received two packages of socks, which I can always use. Today we were using <coughs> sleeping bags, so now we're really well equipped for winter. These last few days of good weather have really favored the Allies. According to the Stars and Stripes, the German supply lines are being literally ripped to pieces by our planes where the Germans were counterattacking. We watched big formations of four motor bombers today as they rode over, roared overhead and headed for targets somewhere in Germany. I've written all the news for now, so I'll sign off and write again in the next couple of days if it's possible. <coughs> Happy New Year to you all, and I hope you are feeling well. I'm feeling fine and I can't kick any, though we're all hoping it won't be long before victory will be ours and we'll be on our way home. Your loving son, brother, and uncle, Bud. Well, I have to tell you, I never went to bed that night. And thank goodness I have a sister that's three hours behind me in Oregon in your house. So I'm like, oh my gosh, you have to do this letter. And on the fifth phone call, I told her husband to just let her answer because I wasn't done. And every letter was more emotional than the next. My dad literally wrote from the first week at Fort Custer, just outside of Kalamazoo in November of 1942, to his last telegram as he was coming home on the Norway victory from Germany in December of 1945. And not only had he had his thousand letters in their original envelopes all in there in their neat little bundles, but he had a photo album that contained 250 corresponding photographs. And the back of every single little two-by-two two black and white photo had writing on it. Even the ones that you'll see from the Germany stages, he has names of all the guys that are in the photographs on the back page. He left us every single when my mother was coming home on that Monday, which was Memorial Day, so that we could attend the service out at the cemetery and go out and see my dad and attend the Mass, I started to get a little bit nervous as it came closer to time for my mom to come home because I thought, yikes, they're never getting out of the house with these letters. This was my mom and dad's courtship. So when I heard the garage door open on Monday, I was really nervous because you couldn't possibly separate me. I needed to read more and know more. I just, I was so engrossed in the whole thing. And my mom came in and she had, quite frankly, just kind of in the midst of all the activity with my dad, forgotten the letters were there, although she does recall him visiting him, visiting them the summer before. For six decades, my dad was the only person that read any of those letters, even though it was a first-hand account of the starry-eyed young soldier who came home a very different, changed person and so much more worldly 38 months later. That day, my mom and I went out to the cemetery, and I have to tell you, I felt like I saw the American flag and our veterans wearing their hats for the very first time. At 44 years old, I felt humbled in how much I did not know and understand and appreciate about our history. And sadly, I couldn't say that to my dad anymore. And I couldn't help but think of all the times that my dad would start to talk about something, and I would say, oh, dad. And again, I still kept asking myself for so long after these letters, what did I mean when I said that? And I don't, I know that it wasn't not being interested. I do believe that it was wanting him to not be sad anymore and wishing that those memories didn't stay so strong in him. Well, it took me 13 months to read all these letters for a number of reasons. One, there were a lot of letters. Two, they were so so little and so frail and so fragile in each of their pages. Three, I had just lost my dad. And that was emotional enough, but now I met this starry-eyed, young, romantic 20-year-old. and He wrote the most insightful, deep, reflective letters. And I was single, and my never married. And my sisters, my oldest sisters, number one and number two, I'm number eight. My oldest sister said, okay, you're never getting married now because you're never going to find a guy like him. That's what you're looking for? Men.
men nowadays don't write love letters like that. So they said. So what I started doing, I would go back on the airport on Monday morning or Tuesday morning, and I would take letters with me and put them in sheet protectors, and I would read a few each week, and then every Sunday night before I left, I would send each of those two sisters, Linda and Connie, envelopes with typing assignments. I didn't know what to do with the letters, but I knew what I couldn't do, and that was simply close the lid on the trunk of the contents. It was a love story, a faith story, but more importantly, it was the beginning to end firsthand account of so many of our 16.2 million Americans who served in World War II. And I'd love the movies, letters from Iwo Jima and flags of our fathers, but I was also so astounded to think that those were bags of letters and individual letters from different soldiers. And this was one from beginning to end of the journey that our soldiers took. So it took me 13 months to read all those letters. And I remember being with my dad one time and he went to visit his sister, who was a sister of Percy, in Farmington Hills. And Cardinal Hickey, who was from Michigan, was there. My dad grew up with Cardinal Hickey. You know Cardinal Hickey? Okay. My dad grew up with him and we were visiting and Cardinal Hickey came in and my dad said, you know, Cardinal, I can't explain it. But I feel like every time I put a slice of bread in the toaster, God gave me back a loaf. 